Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to my home in Livingston, Montana. Well, I've decided on this wintry, blizzardy day up here in the good old state of Montana, I'm going to tell another story. What's the day today, just for the heck of it? It's the 23rd of January of 2019, and it's a Wednesday. Okay, before I start in, let me say this, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm not saying this because my ego's all blown out of shape. I, I don't suffer with ego problems, okay? Let's just put it to you that way. But I got to thinking about this this morning, you know, and I was thinking to myself, is that all you've got in your old age is to sit around and tell stories? Well, another thought came into my mind, and here it is. You take, like, President Donald Trump, for example. Now, first of all, I'm not a Trump hater, but you compare his life to my life. Here I am, an old guy sitting up in Mo up here in Montana, a nobody. I don't have a whole lot of money. i got a relatively modest home and property compared to Donald Trump. You know, he's got all the money in the world, all, you know, all the power in the world, but there is a big difference between Donald Trump and me, and here it is. I've got a head, at least I've got a head full of memories, and some of them are very good memories, some of them are even funny memories, some are not so funny, like Vietnam, for example. But this guy, meaning Donald Trump, has got a head full of nightmares. Now you keep that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, as you listen to my simple little childhood story that I'd like to relay on to you. Okay, now here we go. I used to live in this place called Ronan, Montana as a kid growing up. If you Google it, Ronan, Montana is up along the Rocky Mountains, just on the west side of the Rocky Mountains, very near Flathead Lake. And if you can't find Flathead Lake on Google Maps, you're not looking very good. Flathead Lake is 28 miles long and 15 miles wide. It's the biggest fresh water, water lake west of the Mississippi. Uh, anyway, Ronan, Montana is where I spent a lot of my childhood. It's, 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 it's where my mother was born, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Still to this day, I was looking on Google Maps and I, I found it. There's a creek that runs through Ronan, Montana called Spring Creek. It's just a little tiny, well, it's, Actually, in places, I can remember as a kid, I jumped in that creek many times chasing trout around and everything, but there's places that didn't come up to my waist, maybe even higher than that. Not too wide of a creek, but deep in places, a lot of moss in it, you know. And one of the things about Spring Creek, the old timers up in Montana, every year they'd have a fishing derby, every summer. A fishing derby, I said. And what they would do is they'd stalk Spring Creek, plumb full of trout. You, you know, there would be tr native trout, but they put a bunch of big trout in there for us kids so that we could go out and have this fishing contest, this fishing derby, and whatnot have you. Well, naturally, not all those trout got caught, and some of them trout went on to get big. I mean like six, seven, eight pounders. Are you hearing me? Anytime, ladies and gentlemen, that you have a trout, your average trout, that's over, say, three, four pounds, it's usually considered a relatively big trout, okay? That doesn't pertain to other species of fish. We're just talking about trout here now. Okay. On the, it would be on the south side of town, there was this old bridge that used to go across Spring Creek, coming right out of one of the residential areas. Spring, uh, Paul's, or, uh, Ronan, Montana at the time only had about 6,000 people, 5,500, something like that. Well, my brother and I, we used to fish all the little creeks around that were within walking distance, bicycle distance, or whatever have you. And of course, Spring Creek, because we lived, my mom and dad lived right in the town of Ronan, was definitely worth buying within bicycle or walking distance, especially this bridge I'm talking about. And my brother and I went down to this bridge many, many times, and we'd walk down there along among the cattails and go down, and we'd be looking underneath this bridge, and we could see this big trout laying in there. Underneath the bridge, you got me now. There was these big waves of moss that were 
would, you know, weave around with the with the flow of the stream, and and it was it would expose this big old trout laying in there. And what we would do is we'd take grasshoppers and we'd we'd pitch them off in there, and boy, that old trout would come out of its hiding spot and grab them grasshoppers. And but it never would show it. It it made a point of hiding itself relatively well because that's the way big trout will do, you know. And it stayed way back in the shadows underneath that bridge. And it, it was a road bridge. It wasn't a foot bridge. It was a regular, you know, a vehicle bridge, okay? And I, and I, back in them days, ladies and gentlemen, I was a poor kid. That's why I started this, this story off with the Donald Trump thing, him being a billionaire and me just being a poor old guy, you know? I was so poor back in them days, and how old was I? I got. I was trying to think of this before I started up this movie file. I know, how old are you when you're, say, around the 6th, 7th grade? Because that's how old I was. I'm going to say I was 13 years old. I got a brother that's two years younger than me. He was 11 years old when this incident happened. But we, the point being is we were so broke back in them days, I couldn't even afford a decent fishing pole. You know, I'm talking about one of them little flimsy, you know, four and five dollar, uh, Zeb, uh, four and five dollar poles with a two dollar Zebco 202 reel. We couldn't even afford that. You know, we used to do, we used to cut, cut willow sticks, you know, about this big around, you know, that tapered up, tapered up to say maybe this big around, you know, quarter of an inch up at the top. We cut these big long willow sticks, say seven, eight feet long. Something like that, maybe six foot long, and we cut a notch around the top, and we take like oh you know fifteen twenty feet of marlin filament and just wrap it around there. That was our reel. You follow me? I, we j this pole had no handle, no eyes, no nothing. It was just a willow stick with marlin filament on the end. I know some of you are not believing that, but I don't care what you believe. I'm telling you the truth. But here we were, and Nick and I, that's my brother, we knew that where this big trout was hiding, and we really didn't have the gear to get this trout. We really didn't have the, you know. And so I racked my brains for two or three days trying to come up with some kind of a plan to, 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 to put some iron in the jaw of that big trout. And... And the biggest problem that we had to overcome is that we couldn't afford hooks and sinkers. Are you hearing me? We could, we, between my brother and I, we didn't own one hook and we didn't own one sinker. Back in them days, you could buy a package of hooks, six, six snelled hooks with our leaders already on them for 10 cents. We didn't even have 10 cents. You could buy a little bottle of sinkers, you know, BB sinkers, a little bottle about that big, a couple inches high for 15 cents. 25 cents would buy you hooks and sinkers. We didn't even have 25 cents. So here I am. I got a fishing pole. I got a little piece of fishing leader, monofilament, you know, like I say, 20 feet long or whatever have you, but no hooks. That's the crux of this story. So I racked my brains and racked my brains thinking, how am I going to do this? And finally, one day it dawned on me. I said, Nick, I got an idea. On that big trout that's underneath that bridge, I said, I think I know how we can spear him. Nick says, how's that? You know, we're little demonic kids there, you know, because, you know, we're wanting to eat us some fish, you know. I was raised on eating fish up here in Montana, by the way. But we surfed through my mom's sewing kit. All the old women back up in Montana and back in the day had a, Round ten, you know, full of their buttons and sewing thread and all that. You know what I mean, guys and gals. Sure you do. But we were surfing through my mom's sewing kit, and I stumbled upon a pretty stout safety pin. You know, a, pin, a safety pin about this long. I'm going to say about two inches high. It was a pretty, <laughs> it was a pretty stout safety pin. And I opened that thing up, and I got to, you know, test, and I thought, yeah, this will work. I can spear that big trout with a safety pin. Are you hearing me, folks? Or am I wasting my time here? I hope not. So I told Nick, I said, all we got to do is just go down there and tie this safety pin on the end of my fishing hook or on my fishing pole 
And what we'll do is we'll take a big old grasshopper and spear right on there, you know, and pale right on that fish and or right on that safety pin and, 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 and try to get him that way. And old Nick says, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, let's give it a try. So we go tearing down there. Now we had to be very, very careful because that trout was very spooky. You couldn't go down underneath that bridge at all or it would just go tearing off down in the lower 40 or whatever you know what i mean so i told nick i said the best thing we can do first of all we went and caught us a big fatty grasshopper great big old grasshopper i remember that all too well and i told nick I, and we were real quiet when we came up to the bridge and we walked right on to the, uh, the middle of the bridge and we were on the upstream side of the bridge and I told Nick, I said, all I'll do is I'll impale this grasshopper on this safety hook and we'll just let it go right underneath there and he should grab it. Let me tell you what. Let me tell you about it. I enjoy this. Donald Trump can't tell this story. Speared, impaled that big fatty grasshopper on there and let it underneath that, let it into Spring Creek, Montana and let it go underneath that bridge. And there was the biggest explosion of water you ever heard. And next thing I know, I've got a great big willow stick full of trout. I mean big trout. And I fought with that thing and wrestled with that thing from one side of that bridge to the other and everything. And I figured, oh, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. And my brother told me, he says, Jim, I'll run around. And there was a little trail I went around one side, the right side from where I was standing. And he says, I'll, I'll go down there and try to help you get him in, you know, and all that. And I said, okay. So I get all excited, you know, and I'm pulling mine in the best I can. Or, or well, the pole was kind of long, so I had quite a bit of leverage. And I get him up to the, I, the, the bridge itself was up off the water, ladies and gentlemen. Like, I don't know, it wasn't, it was maybe like four foot, you know. Because this, this creek didn't exactly flood out at runoff time in the springtime. And I'm like, yeah, but it was about a four-foot drop from the from the bottom of that bridge where you stood on the bridge to the water. Four to six foot, I'd say. And I didn't want to wait for my brother to goof anything up or grab the line or wait for that big trout to get off or anything like that. So what I did is I just lifted that big trout straight up and it was sitting there, you know, flopping like, like this and all that kind of stuff. I get him halfway up. This was a good six pounder, six, seven pounder for sure. And that fish fell off of my mother's safety pin fell off and fell back down into the water and was gone. And I pulled that safety pin up and looked at it and it would straighten completely out. You know what I mean? Straighten that. And you want to talk about a sad young man. I was sad just because I couldn't afford 10 cents worth of hooks. But these are the kind of memories, ladies and gentlemen, that stick with a young fella. You know what I mean? I did not get that fish, but I'm sure glad for the memory anyway. Okay, now what I'm going to do, to, so you guys, well, it was really, really storming out there outside right now up here in Montana. I'm going to walk over here to give you a little meat, and I'm going to open up my front door, and, and I'm going to, because lately I've made a few videos complaining about the weather being too fair up here in Montana, you know what I mean? Our snowpack is way off and everything, but we're in, it was snowing pretty heavy, it kind of let off, but I'm going to show you what it looks like up here in Montana when we got doom and gloom. You know what I'm talking about, when big fog banks move in Paradise Valley, then I'm going to end this file, but that's my story. Okay, come on, let's go look, let's go check the weather, okay? Okay, go over here to my front door, which is right there. You might not be able to hear anything. Yeah, that old wind's really blowing out there. See, you can't even see to the other side of town, ladies and gentlemen. You see you see them trees right down there in the middle of your screen past my mailbox and all that stuff? Uh, visibility's only about a mile. But let's step out here for a second. Probably not going to hear nothing. This wind is kind of bad. Anyway, 
okay. Okay, that's all there is to it. Let me come back in here, fall back in here. Now that gloomy weather right there, that foggy weather is what creates SAD, Seasonal Affective Disorder. That's one of the reasons why people can't live in Montana because SAD is one of the biggest problems that we have up here that causes suicide. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for listening to my story. We'll see you on down the trail.